You have to run two miles to get the ball. You have to run two miles to get the ball. You have to run two miles to get the ball. You have to run two miles to get the ball. You have to run two miles to get the ball. You have to run two miles to get the ball. You have to run two miles to get the ball. Did you tell a dude about the cable? Yeah. They said some the guy's busy right now. It's not well, going. I, I just hit it live. Should I, I test call? Yeah. Like that? I only go to college. That one. The other one. Oh, shit. Oh, you fucking kidding me. You gotta be kidding me. Ah, uh, this doesn't take long. It's already done almost. I got a grade. I have a grade. Who wouldn't freak you out? One of the girls. No, as in we guys don't exactly have to touch the meat. That's like, hey, you want to come into the <laughs> Did you tell the dude about um about a different display cable? Because that one's making weird noise. You heard it, right? Yeah, yeah. I just told him. Right. There we go. Now it's Well, I don't think he is. Just Gavin? Yeah, Gavin, Gavin McInnes. It doesn't matter. As long as it's readable. Oh, what happened? There we go. Okay, I can manage. Why do I put this on? You can play some games. Speaking of drama. Oh, holy crap. How's it going? Good, how are you? Pretty good. Sorry, we're getting off to a bit of a late start with the call. Um, we're having a problem with the projector that we're using, uh, but we should have it resolved shortly. Well, you're clearly Mexican. You guys are not really uh, pre-designated to handle that kind of stuff. Is there an Asian person you can call? <laughs> we, we are trying to get the Asian on board right now. Okay. How are I mean, you? I could try to find one. <laughs> That would be great. I'm not India. I can fix you. Oh, we got an Indian somewhere. You wish. Oh, never mind. Um, I'm a beater like you, bro. I think we're good with. Yes, we need the HDMI cable here. Oh, Gavin? Okay. So he wants us to turn it down? They're already trying to silence us? <laughs> yeah, I think you got mad about the joke. <laughs> you're, already, you're already triggering people. We're not even live. <laughs> yeah, we actually have a safe space here now. It's, yeah, you're good. What's in it? Uh, I think some, some crayons, free pizza, Play-Doh. You know, stuff that you haven't used since you were like five. So, yeah. How about some pencil crayons or, you know, some drafting pens? I'm, if you're an adult, you want like some colored markers and some yeah. good quality art supplies. Yeah, you do. I mean, sure, like, the shading has to be right and all that stuff. Yeah, crayons are not, they're not a good instrument. Yeah, plus, if, I mean, if my money is going to this, then I want some high quality art stuff. Yeah, I want like... I want to get a nib. I want a nib. Oh, wow. Inkwell. And then I want some really high quality paper where you can do calligraphy and stuff. Crayons. <laughs> yeah, a little fountain pen. That's cute. Um, let me see if we can go live. Um, uh, one sec. <coughs> Yeah. Should I make that background more? No, I think you're good. Or do you want my background more symmetrical? No, I don't care. Yeah, we're not really here for aesthetics. We're fine. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
I, I was search? really, really hurtful. <laughs> Isaac, should I click source search? You should have said, yes. we're clearly not here for aesthetics. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I was so afraid um, when we got your, your name wrong in the poster. Oh god, that was awful. That drives me mental. After that, I I honestly wanted to uh, add another G just to see what we, you would do, but then I was afraid that you might back out on us, so I was like, maybe I shouldn't joke. I mean, we have to put up with your stupid names, Yepes, <laughs> Asquez, and all this shit. You can at least get the original names correct. Yeah, I mean, I, I do a pretty good job. I was just so excited that you agreed to do this that I, I don't know. You thought you would ridicule me and trivialize my existence. I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't mean to do that. Uh, let's see. Is this ever going to be available to the public? Yes. Uh, we're going to do this live. We already did it with uh, Matt Christensen and uh, Blonde and uh, Dr. Jordan B. Peterson. So we're just getting on this. Is it going to show? Yeah. I don't know. I'm just trying to get one more time. But dude, where's the other I have no idea, man. Okay, so I think we're live now. Are we good? Did you, did you already start broadcasting us? Okay. Just, okay, I lost all feed. Okay. Um, I still see you. Okay, well, that's, that's good. Uh, we got another guy coming in. Uh, so we are live with uh, Mr. Gavin McGinnis. He is the godfather of hipsterdom, uh, one of the co-founders of Vice. He's a proud boy. Um, he's got uh, quite a few other credentials that would take probably a long time to get through. But how are you doing? We're so glad to have you. I'm with the UTEP College Republicans. I'm Isaac Yepes. What's going on? Not a lot. I'm very happy to be here. I'm impressed that you guys are able to do these things without getting shut down. I understand your school has a safe space recently added. Yes. Uh, complete with crayons and Play-Doh. Now, if I was a progressive liberal and I went to your school, any of these schools, I would be pissed at crayons. Crayons are a dollar fifty for a pack. I'm. These schools are... Out of state, you're looking at 47K sometimes, 30 to 40. I want the finest in <laughs> watercolors, nibs. I want all kinds of drafting. Those repeatographs, you know the kind you have to screw in with the little pin thing? Oh, yeah. Front. I want the kind calligraphers have. <laughs> Crayons, that's an insult to this, the, the students. Yeah, I mean, we're an institution of higher learning. Therefore, we should also have higher uh, art materials. Or higher quality, at least. Just because you gave us a safe space doesn't mean we're satisfied with any old crap you throw in there, like a teddy bear and a movie of puppies. I want a documentary about dogs. Mm -hmm. I want the finest art supplies known to humanity. And I wouldn't mind a beer. Yeah, you know, a poorly drawn Snoopy does not make me feel very safe. I want him to have good shading. I want to see little Podunk Pete or whatever his name is. You know, all that now stuff. cooking. What do, you, what do you call Charlie Brown? Podon Pete? Podunk Pete. Who's Podunk Pete? I don't know. <laughs> you just invented a Peanuts character? I think I did. I'm probably going to get sued. Pete. Yeah. There's Linus, there's Lucy, there's Charlie Brown, and of course, Podunk Pete, the man who ran the scrapyard in the back of the Peanuts lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm already getting emails about... I can't say that. Um, so... The other day, you released a video about the Harvard soccer team, uh, men's soccer team, releasing a, um, I guess, a rating system of the uh, women's soccer team. Now, you had some disagreements with that, and they got banned for the entire season uh, for doing this. Now, uh, can, you, can you voice some of your uh, disagreements for those of us that are unaware of your uh, outrage? Well, the rating system from 1 to 10 is a very fun thing that men and women, but mostly men, have been doing for a hell of a long time. 
And what these kids were suspended for was being normal, young, libidinous males. And the reason, by the way, that nature makes males libidinous is so they can make more people. That's why there's 7 billion of us. So if they think that people aren't raiding people, then they don't know human beings. I mean, we've got these videos out now where incredibly morbidly obese women are saying, you know, I know that I'm beautiful and my body image is something I believe in. And you go, so wait a minute, aesthetics doesn't matter anymore. In fact, I think it was BuzzFeed who did a video where they took these supermodel photos like Gigi Hadid and stuff for, for, for Burberry and Polo. And then they recreated them with their morbidly obese bodies mm -hmm. as proof that they are just as pretty as supermodels. And you go, not only did you disprove that, but you did it in a way that is so cruel, the most jock, date-rapey frat in the world would never do that to you because it would be way too mean. But anyway, the, the thing about these Harvard soccer kids is they got caught privately raiding girls, which we all do, and uh, I could tell they were amateurs because when you're raiding people, women, there's two categories. There's you as a person overall, and then there's I'm flipping through a binder of 8 by 10s and I'm just looking at your face. Now, Danny DeVito, if you just look at his face, he's tight, obviously. He's clearly a 4.9, but because he's rich and famous, he's like a 7.8, which means he could get a 7.8. And it's not a science, but you'll notice when HotOrNot.com was around in the early 2000s, there'd be 350,000 people looking at a guy and, and a, or a girl, and the rating would be, you're an 8.7 as... Half a million people have agreed. So we, we are kidding ourselves if we don't think that we're all pretty shallow deep down. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, you can't cover up everything, you know. Um, now, you also are a, a proud boy. Now, can you define what that is exactly? It's very simple. It's just a group of men. It's a fraternal organization, uh, and it's a group of Western chauvinists. By show us, we mean we are very proud of the Western world, mm -hmm. and we refuse to apologize for creating the modern world. That's the only caveat. Now, I have my own personal things I'd like. I'd like if they were Catholics and stuff, but for the most part, that's really all you have to be. It's non-racial. It's purely cultural. But we do get up to the second. There's degrees, just like the Knights of Columbus. And with the second degree, we have to beat the crap out of you till you can name five breakfast cereals. <laughs> and... You may not wank. We uh, have reduced wanking. I'm not sure what words I can use for it. No, so. you're, you're good with whatever. Oh, okay. She can't beat off. You can only ejaculate within one yard of a lady with her consent. Uh, <laughs> and what that does is it gets millennials off the couch courting ladies again, and it gets uh, married men back in bed with their wives and away from the computer. I think porn is – I mean, we have porn stars on my show all the time. I like them as people, but I think porn is a – it's a vice. It's bad for you. It's like heroin. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, because <laughs> you get addicted to the stuff, and then you never want to go out into the real world and deal with anything. Uh, right, and there's, there's scientific evidence behind it too. Yeah, and that's something I wanted to touch on later is how many of these young liberals you're talking to and you realize your entire ethos, your entire philosophy – is based on what you think is probably true. And you haven't looked any of it up. You just say, well, that seems like that would be a thing, and I'm going to believe that. And the, the right, everyone right of center, has looked it up. And as far as porn goes, that's no exception. Uh, there's a great uh, seminar, and it's a book too. I think it's called Your Brain on Porn. And this guy talks about how uh, when you are with 10 digital ladies a day, your brain thinks you're Genghis Khan. And he goes, holy shit, you are kicking ass. Uh, and he starts releasing endorphins because you want to reward the, the most successful barbarian on earth. He's getting 10 tens a day. Let's give him endorphins. And then uh, he's, he gets addicted to that. So he doesn't move out of his parents' house. And he doesn't like a real woman because he's already tricked his brain into thinking that he deserves 10 tens a day. Mm-hmm. Or he it's turns not good. On. And then they, you know, you see that with video games too, and, and internet addiction in general. These these guys, they have a normal level of serotonin in their 30s, uh, but it's fake. And then they move out of the house, they get hit in the face with reality, and they go into a deep depression because they've infantilized themselves. 
And that's really what we're about with the Proud Boys. I've seen a lot of libs get into racial stuff with it and, oh, are they, are they white supremacists or something? Race is discussed maybe 4% of the time, and we're a multiracial group. We even have some homos. But uh, <laughs> it's more about being a decent human being and, and venerating the family again. And, and, you know, you have your wild years, but let's stop saying it's cool to be a slut until your ovaries dry up, and it's cool to be a teenager until you're 45. Yeah, it's not exactly the best thing, especially seeing them at, at shows or something, and they're dressed like they're... They're 19 and they're, you know, 55 and have kids and stuff. Uh, I saw a lot of that in Albuquerque. Don't want to go back. <laughs> um, but, yeah, you you interviewed some people uh, at a Trump protest slash rally. And one of the guys, he said he was a, a graphic designer. And yeah. his shirt looked like it was the most lazy thing I've ever seen. Yeah, and... why didn't you graphic design your shirt? <laughs> <laughs> I think there was like a hundred comments about that. Like, what graphic designer, my ass. And um, now I, you said to him, I think you should be a little careful walking home with that shirt on. And he took that as a threat. Now, right. so you've seen firsthand how easily these people are to accuse you of something. And I think you were just giving them a helping hand. Uh, how, how much or how often do you see that when you interview uh, liberals or anti trumpeteers as they're called? Uh, how often do I see what? Rampant ignorance? Naivete? I mean, that kid, I, I, I was genuinely concerned about him. We were in a mob. Like, to get to a Trump rally, you can't park within a mile. So you've got to walk for a mile. So that's thousands and thousands of people walking. Now, go to a, a Jay Z concert with a shirt that says, fuck Jay Z or Rap Sucks, or even NYPD. But these kids are coming to these shows with a shirt that says, every single person here is an idiot and sucks and is bad for America and your country. Like his shirt said American, that was never great. So he, oh you're, sh you're crapping on everything about everyone in this massive venue that must have had 20,000 people. So the fact that he wasn't pounded into jam is living proof that we are pretty decent folks. And the worst he was getting was like, get a job and stuff. Mm -hmm. But in any other situation, shit, go to a gay parade with the God Hates Bags poster and I bet you'll get the crap beaten out of you. Mm -hmm. We, and we're seen as the most fascist intolerant people, but the Trump supporters are some of the kinds, and that guy didn't have any friends with him. He just walked home back to his fake graphic designer job <laughs> with no <laughs> hassles whatsoever. And you think, Jesus, these people are real sweethearts. Mm -hmm. um, now, later on in that rally, you you met a guy who looked like he belonged in a, I don't know, in a South Park episode. He was like breathing all over himself. He had these huge bifocals on, and then he said he wanted to fix us, uh, meaning that you know, for thinking that Trump was a a good candidate, that something had to be wrong with us. There was no other explanation. It right. just had to be a mental defect. And you dealt with him in a sort of way where you turned his own jargon back on him. Uh, how, how successful was that uh, for those of us that have not seen this, uh, this exchange that you had with him? It's so easy. I mean, Tucker Carlson's new show on Fox News, Tucker Carlson Tonight, he just seems to have devoted every episode to showing these people that when you base your entire world philosophy on a hunch, all they have to do is ask you three questions and everything falls apart. And it, they have a very unscientific view of life. Like if a doctor said uh, uh, coffee is what's making you sick and that, that's your problem and you stop drinking coffee and you're still sick, the doctor would say, huh, crap, I, was, I could have sworn it was the coffee. Oh, well, my theory didn't pan out. But what they keep doing is they go, well, your body's wrong. Uh, you're still, uh, you're not sick anymore. Now you're lying to me. And that guy's thing was, so uh, Trump hates Muslims, and anyone who likes Trump wants all Muslims to die. ISIS kills more Muslims than anyone. Ergo, Trump should support ISIS. So the scientist right there with his theory has been confronted with data that contradicts his hypothesis, and he just thinks, well, I'm super smart, and maybe <laughs> Trump and his people haven't thought of that. And I'm like, dude, what you just said is proof that we don't want Muslims to die. Mm -hmm. You've just deduced that yourself. You just figured it out on your own using logic. But no, then he sticks to, I'm about love. I'm not about hate. I hate war. And you go, dude, nobody wants war. 
Yeah. No one wants to. No one wants eighteen-year-olds to go away and die. There's times when we need war, and it's a real bummer. We don't like seeing those coffins come back with American flags on them. Now, plenty of Muslims in the Middle East think it's it's wonderful to die in battle. You're a martyr. You're eternal. You can go hang out with seventy-four prunes or whatever the hell the Quran says. <laughs> seventy-four <laughs> girls who suck in bed. Like, don't you want seventy-four porn stars or something? It's, I guess you're going to be with him for infinity. You guys can work on that. But, um, he, uh, yeah, he's totally hysterical about his own philosophy. And when he gets confronted with data that contradicts his beliefs, he becomes more steadfast in those beliefs and has a nervous breakdown because he's never, he's never thought of it. He's never debated it before. He starts with this theory that, you know, like with gay marriage, two people want to be in love. People who are in love should be together. That's the end of that. If you don't like that, then you hate love. And you go, maybe it's not that. Maybe it's an excuse to bully Catholics. Yeah, and uh, I also saw a syllogism um, that a guy had said on, I think on Twitter, um, it was not every Trump supporter is a racist, but every racist is a Trump supporter. And it just kind of blew my mind that it had like a thousand retweets and people were like, yeah, definitely. You know, um, and I experienced it firsthand in Albuquerque uh, when I was doing a campaign drive for Trump. Uh, I was called a fascist. I was told I was in the wrong neighborhood a few times, and then they called me a wannabe white boy. So yeah. uh, they they seem to think that anybody that disagrees with them is automatically a racist or fascist or in somehow some way a white supremacist. But that's see that's this is junior high logic. It's mm -hmm. guilt by association. And okay, let me use that same philosophy. Say hypothetically, it's totally true, and all racists support Trump. Well, every, not every Muslim is a suicide bomber, but every suicide bomber is a Muslim. Mm -hmm. So you come up with this data and you end up going, yeah, so? Like, you might as well tell me that Hitler used toilet paper. Did you know you're using the same method to clean your bum that Hitler used? Are you proud of yourself? Uh, I don't care how Hitler wiped his ass. Yeah. Well, he did it the same way you did, my friend. And Muslims don't. So think about that next time. <laughs> Yeah. You go, guilt by association, ad hominem attacks. Like, didn't we all do this in high school or junior high? Didn't we go through all these? It's as Stefan Molina calls it the tall Chinese person thing, where you go, this group overall has a disproportionate number that have this habit. I've noticed an overall pattern. Of course it doesn't apply to every single person. But then they'll find someone like a tall Chinese person and they'll go, oh, really? Asians tend to be shorter than, than black people? What do you call this guy, Jeremy Lin? He's over 6'7". And you go, congratulations, my pattern no longer exists because you found an exception to it. Yeah, well, the way they explain it away when people like myself uh, think differently than they do is, well, you're just an Uncle Tom or you're a sellout. Or uh, a popular one is coconut around here. Uh, you know, you're brown on the outside, white on the inside. Mexicans? Are, why don't Mexicans get this rep as brown? You guys aren't even very brown. Yeah, I'm, I'm clearly Some not. Of us are. <laughs> like a very slight hue of mocha. Yeah, like a like a buttercream kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's weird too to take identity politics. The whole concept of identity politics confuses me. Like abortion. Oh, you're pro life, so you must hate women. And you go, about fifty percent of women are pro life. Mm -hmm. It's really a question of it's like euthanasia or something. You're talking about when does a human life start? What has that got to do with gender? Plenty of women think it's murder. Plenty of men think it's murder. I don't understand why, why you, you have to be on one gender side uh, if you're pro-life or pro-choice. And the same thing with, with Trump and his Mexican crap. He said, we're getting some of their worst people, fact, uh, a lot of them are rapes, rapists. Well, 80% of these girls crossing the border get raped. So that's, that's a lot of rapists. Uh, we're not getting the best of the best. Fact to fact, 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 which is why such a huge percentage of Mexican American citizens support Trump and are against illegal aliens because they live with these people and these people are bad news. Well, another startling thing about that is it came straight from Huffington Post, the reported 80 percent. And right. when you put that to them, they go, well, you know, they get some things wrong, but, you know, otherwise they are my Bible. And I find that really strange, and it's hard to deal with the mental gymnastics of uh, putting certain things in compartments and other things can come out. 
Uh, they're totally against binaries until it comes to whether you agree with them. And right. uh, how how bad does it get? Because I mean, you're you're really in the thick of things a lot more often than any of us are. So, what have you seen in in this uh, perspective? Being being of, of the others, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's not bad. By the way, that Huffington Post thing, that girl must regret writing that so much. I think she came at it from a feminist thing, and she's like, ooh, this is great. I have people of color, and they're women, and they're getting raped, so I killed two birds with one stone. Let me put this up. <laughs> and, but instead, she just accidentally exposed these coyotes as uh, bad human beings. In fact, it's become such a rape culture, the border crossing, that these women will take birth control. Before they go, because well, I, I, my pussy is part of my currency, so I'm just exchanging that. Like I don't, I don't even think they cry when they go through it. I think they just sort of go, "Well, uh, here we are. <laughs> this was part of the deal." And you go, "That's the rape culture that you st- college students won't shut up about." There it is, right in your face. But uh, actually, I, for for Rebel Media today, I wore all Trump clothes and I rode the subway through the hipster part of town. I didn't go anywhere scary because I'm a chicken. But um, it wasn't that bad. It was – I got a lot of like <laughs> – but in New York, if you wear that hat, they assume you're mentally ill and a psychotic murderer. So they kind of stay away from you. So uh, I don't know. I think it's one of those things where you figure it must be the worst thing in the world. And then when you wear like a MAGA hat in New York, you kind of get looks from chicks. Because no one's called anyone's bluff before, and they sort of go, wow, this guy has balls. He can protect us if the revolution comes. I want to be on his team. It's like a subliminal cave thing. Yeah. Uh, because they, they have become increasingly authoritarian, and uh, you know you can see one of the things with the third wave feminists where they say, you know, I'm 800 pounds overweight, but if you don't find me attractive, you're an awful human being. And people are afraid to stand up to it, but... Time and time again, you see these huge corporations like Target giving into it, and they see their stock plummet. But yeah. when companies go against it, like the uh, British advertisement uh, company, who said, "You know, well, so what if your your if your feelings are hurt?" So why do you think that these people? Um, why do you think the general public is afraid to stand up to them? Because whenever they're confronted with actual uh, arguments and somebody standing up against them, they cower. Well, this, the advent of social media has corporations have been very slow to get with the program and they see a tweet from a 19 year old, like with Terry Richardson, some 18 year old girl in Britain said, Oh, Terry Richardson, it's ripe culture. Just based on something she assumed and H and M shut him down and he was a pariah for at least a year based on some teenager's tweet who's never even been on this side of the ocean. And I think another big part of it too is, Someone, every corporation now has their Facebook department, their Twitter department, their Instagram department. And these women, probably mostly women, probably gays and women, they, uh, they don't do anything. So they're, the, they see the boss walk by and they go, i got to get something. And then when they finally get a tweet, they go, oh, Mr. Peterson, Mr. Peterson, I had a bad tweet. Uh, I, I, they said bad things about us and they said a bad thing about this photographer we work with. And they go, finally, I have a reason to exist. I can justify my job. So then the guy probably doesn't even care. He goes, okay, well, uh, kill that account or something, and now we can check a box off that you've done something this month. So it's really a lot of fake work and fake hysteria. But, you know, Alexis de Tocqueville, when he he came here uh, and wrote Democracy in America, I forget when it was, the early 1800s, he uh, was really impressed with how unique America was. And he said, democracy is slow and sluggish and inefficient, But once the people set their minds to something, nothing can stand in their way. And he said, the people, uh, and and in this case of Trump, sorry, the people have set their mind to giving up on all that grievance culture, all that victim culture, and we're not going to see this anymore. Now, it's slow. I was shocked at how slow it was. On November 10th, I was sort of walking down the street going, okay, we're done now. You all have to shut up. All your fake jobs are done. No more whining. Let's get back to work. And they were sort of, no, oh, no, no, no. We're going to smash windows, and we're going to do a recount, and we're going to yell at you. Rare. And I'm going to throw your mega hat in the garbage. And you go, okay, how long is it going to take you to uh, realize what's going on here? Because we're ready to start. 
<laughs> yeah, we saw him walk by a little while ago. Um, <laughs> now, somebody... my roommate is super short. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, Matt Christensen, he recently uh, created a scandal um, in that he and his friend on Twitter messaged, I think it was Amy Harvard or some uh, journalist, if journalist. Um, they sent her a completely fabricated hate crime, and she published it without any scrutiny or any qualifications or anything like that. And when they tried to get her to retract it because, like, hey, we made it all up, uh, joke's on you, she didn't even mention it, and it's still up there. And she's been on the Huffington Post, Salon, and all that other crap. But um, how often do you think that happens if something as blatant as this uh, is uncovered within you know, a couple days. Look, we keep hearing about the Klan and mm -hmm. all these racists that are everywhere. I'm st there's probably about 17 of these guys that are dominating <laughs> about 80% of political discourse. And these guys are rednecks with pickup trucks. They don't like the city. The last thing they would ever do is come to a school and yell the N-word at some random kid. And we keep seeing these, these hoaxes like, there was a noose on this assistant professor's door, and you go, yeah, yeah. The racists went there, found parking, got the, their little parking verification thing, found the assistant professor's door, and put a noose there, and then ran away. Hee <laughs> hee, we got her, Enos, yeah! And every time they show these crimes, you just go, that's not how racists work. Like, even that movie uh, Matthew McConaughey did where he has AIDS, oh, and yeah. he figures out a cure, there's a scene in it where someone wrote something like faggot blood, on his trailer, and it's beautifully written in dripping blood, and you go, yeah, uh, that's not how racists work. <laughs> they don't have nice fonts, and they don't get a beautiful, really shocking tone of red <laughs> that's going to drip down. And you see this, lesbians are really good at hate crime hoaxes, and it always oh, yeah. says, like, go home, dyke, on her garage door in dripping red, and you're, you go, no one cares about lesbians, no offense, lesbians, uh, and racists don't sit there with paint. They're not artistic people. They don't, they might shove you or yell something from their truck, but they're not going to like do an art piece on your wall and a dripping font and every hate, like these, they just had a thing in the Adam Yawk Park here in New York where someone wrote like, go Trump, which no Trump supporter would ever say. And it had two of the worst swastikas you've ever seen. Yes. It's the kind you did when you were eight years old to shock your teacher. That <laughs> in the bathroom stall. That's all really you can draw if you're a kid trying to shock people. And they had this massive parade of people coming together against hate. And there was imams and rabbis and Adam Horowitz was there and he was saying a speech. And you just go, Jesus, the demand for hate is so much higher than the supply that every time there's a glimmer of it, they all go nuts. And even if it's fake, they go, yes, finally, <laughs> they start eating it like these rabid wolves. Yeah. Um my uh, at my university, um, in I'm in kind of the belly of, of the beast. Uh, I'm in a the liberal arts department for American literature. Uh, there's three different professors that were uh, on the verge of tears after Trump won, and I mean these are grown adults doing this in front of their their students, and then the students were like crying too. And I really love, you know, liberal tears, so I was just swimming in it all day, and they thought I was reprehensible for this, but, you know, um, they, they don't seem to understand that we've been listening to them for eight years, and now they have to listen to us for one day, and they, they freak out. Um, yeah, it's not a day. I'm going to be gloating for months. Oh, yeah. Months, months. <laughs> but, well, I mean, at and the time. down the street. It's our time to gloat because they are they're they're cheaters. You know, Hillary's talking. Joe Stein is talking about this recount with Hillary, and they have been caught cheating. Like Project Veritas had that video come out the day of the election where the guy was talking about busing in Hispanics and Blacks and and Chinese from uh, outer boroughs and bringing them in to vote DNC, and uh, they still are under the impression that they are the victims. And you go, we've been the the victims of your dirty tricks, you're uh, cheating for so long and you handled it so badly that now that we finally won, even though you cheated, 
It's almost like an 80s teen film, like Meatballs or something, where the bad guys cheat, but the good guy still manages to win at the end. Like in Breaking Away, where they mess with his bike, but he still wins at the end. That's what we just experienced. It's actually the perfect American tale of overcoming adversity. Well, what kind of... Uh, it's, it's a little surprising to me uh, when minorities come out in support of Trump uh, the rules suddenly change. We go from, you know, oh, well, it's all white people's fault that, that uh, Trump won. And first of all, it's not their fault. It's, you know, great job. Um, <laughs> but when it was like actually by the numbers, I think uh, Mr. Levant did this. Uh, you, you saw a swing, a huge swing of the poorest of the poor and Hispanics and blacks changing their vote radically to the right wing. And then the narrative changes, and then it's, oh, well, because everybody's racist and hates Muslims. And I, I don't think you can ever really argue against it because they live in this world that must be hateful in order for their rationale to make sense. So it's, it's almost like, like uh, brainwashing, I think. Yeah, but they've drained that word to death. It doesn't mean anything anymore. It's not even insulting anymore. You just you're a racist. It sort of means you're a Grinch or you're a you're a curmudgeon or something. It's meant like you're mean. In fact, that's another big thing of theirs with mean people suck stickers all over the place. But when you everything is racist, nothing is. And to constantly be pinning every program from you know college tuition to the Fed to immigration to Fidel Castro dying, everything is racist. You just go. What are you, me, when I was 14? Shut up. It's exhausting. And, you know, Ann Coulter said uh, that our blacks are better than their blacks once. And <laughs> she was talking about Thanksgiving and how, you know, a conservative in the South goes to Thanksgiving and everything is fine. So he's almost like a liberal in a way that, in that he's in a bubble of, of people agreeing with him. But uh, a black guy goes to a Thanksgiving if he's a pro-Trump dude, and he just gets lambasted by all his relatives. That's if he's still invited, by the way. A lot of them weren't invited to Thanksgiving this year. Tommy Sotomayor was replaced by a pedophile. Uh, and you end up better at your arguments. You end up better at adrenaline control. You end up with more research. You end up with having all your data. You've heard of their arguments before, and you go, that actually wasn't in 1860. That was much later. And you end up with a higher caliber political pundit. And I would argue that not only are our blacks better than their blacks, our everything is better than their everything. Our wives are better than their wives. <laughs> well, I, I think part of that has to do with, you know, we believe that you should work for a living. And I don't know how that became racist all of a sudden. Um, yeah, it's not racist. It's evolutionary. You, you, the ones who didn't derive pleasure from hard work are extinct. They didn't survive. And the ones who did prospered. So there's more of us now. And you see that with the American Indian community. You see this sort of, the more money they get, the more despair they have. You know, you give an Indian a house and he can't sell it. Sure, he's got a free house, but he's kind of a slave to this home that he can't leave, that he can't use, he can't renovate. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, you strip him. And I knew a guy, he used to look, look after my house in uh, Costa Rica. He was a surfer who was on the land. And he was, uh, he had no passport, couldn't use his real name. Now, yes, he's in Costa Rica. It's very nice. He can surf. But because he had no freedom and he couldn't leave whenever he wanted, and he was stuck in that country for 10 years, like Cuba in a way, he was kind of a Cuban. Uh, he hated it. He was miserable. It chipped away at his soul. Now, speaking of Cuba, I've got to touch down on this. Uh, Trudeau and Obama had some very interesting things to say about the death of Castro. Uh, I thought they would have been celebrating because, you know, he's an enemy of, of liberalism. Uh, but they came out in praise. They were like, what a great man. I'm so sorry he's gone. You know, never going to be forgotten, that kind of thing. Uh, and then Trump was the one who actually said, this is a brutal dictator. Um, hopefully now they can start moving forward and they can start, uh, you know, working for themselves. They can start earning a living and things like that, and get actual health care. Um, what, what do you think about that, the, the dichotomy between Trump coming out against a uh, dictatorship like this, a despot, and Trudeau? Well, what was his first comment, too? He goes, Trump is dead. I mean, sorry, he goes, Castro is dead. Boom. 
Yeah, that's perfect. And you know that Castro would happily murder Obama or Trump or Trudeau. He would never. Castro would never release a statement in, uh, when Justin Trudeau died. Not that, uh, uh, although Justin Trudeau might be his son. Those pictures are pretty. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing about Obama's thing was, uh, it was just a his classic Obama total pussy move, where he goes, oh, "I'm not going to say anything good or bad. History will judge him. Uh, I don't want to piss off my white liberal rich leftist Marxist friends, but I also don't want to advocate uh, a despot." But Trudeau went off the rails and talked about how he was larger than life. And this is something that really bothered me about his thing was served his country for 50 years. First of all, I'm sick of you politicians thinking you're doing us a favor with your public service. We don't want you. When you take my money at gunpoint, you're not doing me a service. So stop pretending you're some sort of a military man holding vigil outside my home with a gun willing to die to protect me. You're not, I don't want, I didn't hire you. Uh, and then secondly, 50 years of owning his citizens. That's not serving them. He was a plantation owner, literally, worth hundreds of millions of dollars when the average salary there was, what, $25 a month? You know, killed thousands of people, most of his friends, just because he was suspicious of them. And Trudeau ignores all that and says, I think he was a great man who, who <laughs> served his country. It really goes to show you the, the why we needed Trump. I mean, we had either wishy-washy losers who don't want to offend anyone or rich kids that are so naive that they think it's okay to be a dictator. And we just finally needed a guy to go, in. you know what, this is all bullshit. Uh, and he also said, by the way, that uh, we're changing that Cuba plan. I don't like that deal that got set up. Uh, we either fix it, make it better for the Cuban people, or we're not doing business with you. Which was a great way of saying, Raul, if you're con going to continue to be Fidel, then the, the axe is going to fall. Yeah, big time. And there, there needs to be um, incentives to, to turn away from things like that. Uh, we'll be taking questions from the room in just a minute. Uh, we have a question from the chat from Penny May. She asks, how did he... I like that name, Penny. <laughs> Not like a good girlfriend name. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going out with Penny on Thursday night. Penny. <laughs> I like that a lot more than Candace. Um, how did he make his back tattoo look like it really had Castro on it? I have a giant tattoo on my back that says creative destruction, and it is a, a cyber kind of a robotic jellyfish eating Chiang Kai-shek and Fidel Castro. So I merely showed the Fidel Castro part of that tattoo, but it is completely real. <laughs> oh my god um, made a lot of dumb decisions over the years with skin art actually I but this is one of the worst ones look at that oh look what, what does it, it says, say it says what <laughs> <laughs> oh wow good lord Gavin <laughs> I used it for gossip like someone would say oh did you hear she had an abortion on Christmas Eve and I would go <laughs> what <laughs> And then inevitably the person would go, what? Did that, did that hurt? What have you done to your face? And we'd get off the subject of the gossip, so it ended up backfiring. I, I think it's a great icebreaker. Um, <laughs> now, you you did a little interview. I forget the name of the, the, the company that did it, but you were showing off your tattoo on one of your arms of an AK-47, and it had something written on it. Uh, what does it say and what does it mean? It says desire in Urdu, and it means arm your desires. Uh, this is an Arabic language, and I guess I was enabling terrorists. I was saying, don't be a refugee. Stand and fight. Stand against your oppressors. This was before ISIS and everything. I think they took me a little too seriously. And ISIS, if you're watching and you were inspired by that tattoo, I didn't mean that much. <laughs> just, like, just take care of your business. Don't go country to country killing people. I'm, I'm hereby officially calling ISIS off. Now, stop. Stop. <laughs> uh, Donald Trump, when he had to disavow all the hate crimes. All the fake stop hate it crimes. Now. Yeah. Um, now, they, they have this idea where if you don't disavow something constantly, then you're implicitly in favor of it. I think that's right. one of the most ridiculous things I've which ever is, heard. Which is an, uh, it's an implication. It's an allegation, right? Uh, why do you beat your wife? 
Yeah. Well, but you've already said I beat my wife now. I'm, I'm backtracking going, I, I, I don't beat my wife. How, why, why haven't you disavowed your best friend, David Duke? Uh, I don't, uh, uh, now you look like you're scared about your friend, David Duke. It's 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 all in Solinsky's rules for radicals. He talks about all these tricks you can do, and they've employed them all. Yeah, or they they have the uh, the famous Kafka trap, where uh, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Um, right. You know that's that's what somebody who's a racist would say. Uh, now, do we yeah. have any questions from the general? What's going on? Well, third, do I just yell it out to you? Yeah, just. I had a question. I know your your wife is an Indian, uh, feather not dothead. Um, I want to know what your opinion was on the whole pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if it was Canadian or American. Indian. American. Um, I, I have to really research the crap out of it because uh, our family is super obsessed with it. <laughs> but uh, the, the two things I saw were a map of enough pipelines going through America that it said, which pipeline is it again you're mm -hmm. talking about? And it looked like varicose veins. And then the other thing I heard was they got offered 10 million and they said, uh, no, we want 20. So it's a matter of not paying enough. Mm. Uh, I don't know. I was thinking about this today. What's the matter with digging up dead bodies if they've been there for, you know, 100 years? Because if, if <laughs> even like a, a Christian cemetery... If you're in a box and your soul has any merit in that box, that's terrible. You're supposed to get to fly out of the ground. And what do you want to do when you're a ghost? You want to go watch people have sex. You want to go to the White House, hear some secrets. If you're locked <laughs> in a box for 500 years, you're going to come out and everyone will be, their name will be like asterisk, exclamation mark, 3x4, speaking yeah. Dargosian. And you're like, this is, I can't haunt these people. They're robots. Like they have sex with maybe a tube that goes around their genitalia through a computer. And you're like, I can't spy on this. This is boring. You know what I mean? It's a tough life for a ghost. So let them free. Dig it up. Let them haunt. I'd like yeah. to point out that a long enough timeline, even those bodies will be oil too. Oh, there we go. Uh, <laughs> replenishing. Um, what was that? He said that. On a long enough timeline, even those bodies are going to be oil too. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the whole problem with pollution, too, in general. We can't put these bags in the ground. Yeah, where do you think we got them? Yeah. They came from the ground. They're just going back home. <laughs> yeah. It's a bag for unification project. Yeah, if, if I were to become a ghost, I have a long list of haunting to do. Uh, are there any other questions from the room? Okay, it's just you and me. Um, so... With the death of Castro, do you think anything's actually going to change, or do you think his brother is just going to maintain the status quo there? I think that uh, a lot of people lived in fear of uh, Castro, including Raul. I mean, he when uh, Castro killed one of his him and Raul's closest allies, uh, Raul was traumatized by it and became a, an alcoholic. And Castro said, "Stop drinking, or I'm going to blow your head off too." And now that that despot is done Raul can try to continue it but I don't think he has the heart for it and inevitably we saw this with Chinese communism in Hong Kong inevitably the money seeps in I mean you got to be real stubborn to not see the joy of capitalism and the fact that Cuba has so much arable land I mean I used to go there as a Canadian on vacation and you go to these beautiful resorts all surrounded by razor wire and you realize they could have so much industry if they would just uh give up on this archaic, brutal religion called communism. Yeah, and speaking of communism, it's uh, somewhat nicer cousin socialism. Uh, they, there's been a, a strong push, especially with Obamacare, to make a, uh, I guess, a government mandate that you have to buy health care because it's, it's so great. Um, now, you come from Canada. Uh, what is your experience with the socialized uh, health care plans and, and uh, the actual health care you receive? Well, I'm from Britain, too. Oh. And uh, if you want a, you know, a hip replace, you got to go to the end of the line. And that often means you're waiting so long your cancer metastasizes. And it's illegal for Canadians to go to America and pay cash. But they break that law all the time. 
because it's a matter of life and death. And it's funny because with dogs, you can just go anywhere, obviously. And a lot of uh, dogs will get better care than Canadians because you're allowed to pay cash for it. So the Canadian and British system may have worked 100 years ago. I don't know. But as far as me getting into bar fights in Montreal goes, you're looking at about 12 hours in ER. It is no utopia. And it's obviously not free. I mean, the tax you pay in, America, in Canada is brutal. And another thing about Canada, too, is with these insane taxes and this massive government program, it's not an entrepreneurial country, which is why we had to get vice out of there. It, it, it doesn't see it as a good thing. You're a sellout. It's, it's like the entire culture is based on a children's movie where the evil rich guy in the suit is, is hurting the little mom and pop. Uh, we have a question from Tony in the chat. Uh, what do you think of the mainstream media praising Castro but smearing Trump for his supposed ties to Putin? Uh, it just shows that they are, have no stake in the game and they are not interested in data. They're not interested in America. For them, it's sports. And their team is the Marxists. That's the Dallas Cowboys. And they hate all other football teams. They don't care who's doing steroids. They don't care if it gives you concussions. They don't care. They haven't even really looked into the game that much. They don't go to games. They just know that they want this team to win. And their team is Castro. So if he killed 7,000 people, that's not as bad as Donald Trump whispering to someone that you might be able to grab a groupie's pussy once. Yeah. It's just a shocking uh, level of hypocrisy. So uh, with that, they don't even really go to the games. Uh, that ties into the SJWs kind of dictating what happens in shows and comic books and other forms of media that they don't even uh, watch or have a stake in. Uh, why do you think it is that they, they do this? Is it, is it a power thing or is it just that I, I'm really unsure of what else I could say that would be? I think it is a power thing. You know... I remember some guy saying this, that the unique was a Mexican guy saying the, the unique thing about you white people is when someone says racism and shoots at your feet, you dance. No other group does that. You shoot at a black guy's feet and go racist and he just takes a bullet in the toe. <laughs> We're the only people who do that. And I think when you have nothing else to offer the world and you're a bitch by nature and you go, I don't like your video game. People kowtow to them, just like that social media department woman I was talking about earlier. People go, what? What's going on? Okay, uh, I'll try to fix it. Uh, what's your problem now? I don't know. Western culture, I think the worst thing about it is this need to capitulate, this need to apologize, this need to take everyone so seriously, even the spoiled brats. Oh, you want candy for dinner? Okay, well, that's going to make you sick, isn't it? But I'll see what we can do. Maybe we can find healthy candy. Um, Kai, Kai Kai 69. Uh, Kai Kai? <laughs> yeah. What a range of names. Kenny is one of the prettiest names for a girl. Kai Kai, I think, is the worst name you could have. Yeah, well, I mean, you Although stop they it. they did once plant like, trees in northern Ontario so with an African guy named Bum Bum Booba. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, Bum Bum. Hi, I'm Bum Bum. <laughs> uh, you can call me Bum. <laughs> Sounds like a clown name. Uh, yeah. If he was okay, so it asks if you were friends with Harmony Corinne back in the day when you used to hang with Terry Richardson. No, no, I met him <laughs> once. Terry and him had some intense fight right before I started hanging out with him, where Harmony Corinne was allegedly waiting in Terry's lobby carrying a butcher knife because he was going to kill him. Oh, and during, he didn't realize that Terry was a heroin addict at the time and was going to sleep all day. And as he was waiting there with the knife, hours went by, and at one point the UPS guy comes. So Harmony has to put the knife down, get the UPS thing, sign for it, <laughs> get the guy's thing back, put the package down, and then get back to waiting with his knife. <laughs> the imminent part. But I never saw the guy. I like him a lot. You know, he's a very interesting artist, and he started this thing called The Mistakers, where their goal in life was to make tons of mistakes. Make big, bold, bad moves and screw up. Fuck up your movie by making it all classical music. I don't know. Uh, spend the whole thing on color correction. I don't know. Some really crazy moves. And it was just inspiring. I remember he, he did a book, a kind of a jokey art book called I Crack Up at the Race Riots. You can look him up on David Letterman talking about it. And David Letterman gets really mad. Because you dare to say that racism is boring to you. And uh, he said, oh, you're a real Boy Scout, aren't you? And Harmony Corinne just went, 
Uh, <laughs> um, you know, it is funny to look at 2016, look back at race riots. It's hilarious. What a stupid thing. <laughs> what a laughable thing. Anyway, i got to wrap it up here. Let's take one more, and i got to put my kids to bed. I give them force fields, which protects them from bad dreams and monsters. All right. Um, so there was... I'll give you one right now. Ready? <laughs> That end part is I'm vacuum sealing it around your body, so you can move around and stuff. Oh, that's that's nice. Um, now uh, there was a woman who was a doctor or something. I think you were on CNN on a conference call via Skype, and you called her a uh, quote fucking idiot uh, yeah. because she made you or she kept putting words in your mouth, and then you kept trying to clarify that you didn't say that. Then the other four would cut you off while you try to make your point. Uh, yeah. What exactly? Huffington Post, HuffPo Live. Yeah, that's a good last question. Uh, what was annoying about that was I was saying most women would be happier at home. And this, she's like a fake lawyer who's an assistant to some person who's in academia, in law, which is, you know, you basically can't get fired. And she thinks that she's out there contributing to society as her ovaries dry up. And uh, <laughs> she was. I was talking about this study from the University of Pennsylvania that asked 800 women if they were happier uh, over the course of 10 years, and they noticed a drop in happiness. And it was a well-respected study. And, and, you know, the only difference in the past 20 years was rampant feminism. So feminism has made women less happy, less family, more work, less joy, less mommies. Um, And there are less mommies in America if you factor out immigration. Anyway, one of the professors goes... Well, you can sit here with your made-up studies. And I just thought, <laughs> that's like playing pool with someone and they accuse you of hiding one of the balls so you could win. Well, why are we playing pool together? It's a given when we go to play pool that neither of us are going to cheat. And if you're calling me a cheater, well, why are we going to sit here and just make up studies? Is that what this fight is? That doesn't make any sense. And then she goes, people like Gavin would be would be much happier if it were, no, believes something like, believes that women shouldn't be allowed to work. And that just got me so mad because she set up this straw man uh, of this guy who wants it to be illegal for women to work. And I lost my temper and I called her a fucking idiot. But one thing I've been doing, and it's a fun game with liberals, is you play out their scenario. Mm -hmm. So instead of going, I never said that, you go, all right, let's pretend I did say that. How does that world work? It's illegal for women to work. How is this enforced? There's some woman with a fake mustache and a f- her hair up in a fedora who comes to work with a briefcase going, hello, I'm a man. My name is John. <laughs> and then she's sitting at her desk and I'm like, there's a woman uh, at this place. We need to send in the woman police. And then these guys show up and they rip off her mustache and get in the paddy wagon. And woo, woo. <laughs> she's taken away back to the kitchen where she's locked. Maybe Islam has that as a plan. Maybe Sharia law will include that one day. But obviously, no Western male wants it to be illegal for women to work. And once again, just like that Adam Yock thing with the fake swastikas, you've taken some feathery premise, turned it into an absolute concrete law, and then said, I hate that thing. I never said that. That's not my thing. And no one would say that. That's not a real thing. (laughs) Well, I mean, that sounds like a Tyler Perry movie right there. Uh, God it's knows not, he needs more movies to make. Um, the day is not a real thing. <laughs> um, yeah, well, thank you so much for joining us, Gavin. Um, uh, it was a pleasure having you for the Unfiltered series, and uh, we hope to hear from you again in the spring or uh, something like that. Uh, you have a great night. Maybe I am... <laughs> Maybe. Um, I'm Isaac Yepes, uh, the recruitment officer of the UTEP College Republicans, and we hope to hear from you soon. Right on. Thanks for having me, and I hope you guys get better uh, art supplies in the safe space room. <laughs> oh, no. All right. Uh, round of applause from everybody, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. See you later, man. All right. Have a good night. All right. Um, thank you guys for coming and everything. Uh, this is the second to last uh, iteration of Unfiltered. We're having some dumb American. That is her tag uh, next week on Tuesday, same time, same place. And she is a slightly right wing, but socially left wing person. So she will be an interesting listen to have.
So, is that yeah. how she describes herself? No. <laughs> what does what, what, what what she call herself? She's, uh, I guess she would just say like a mainstream Republican. Uh, I haven't really heard her what define herself. Um, so things like if we're ideologically opposed on an issue, she will take um, the person who's less partisan about it. So typically, like with the anti-SJW uh, community, uh, she'll side with the SJW sometimes when she's like, hey, you guys are being unfair here. Uh, so I guess it's kind of centrist, but sometimes she does say some things that I'm like, whoa. Like, <laughs> so, uh, like she tries a little bit too hard to avoid No, I don't think she tries too hard. I think she uh, it comes uh, naturally or, or something, but it's interesting to hear. Uh, hello. <laughs> So how long have you guys been doing the unfiltered? Is it a, that's what you guys call it series? Yes, we've been doing it since November first. We had Dr. Jordan B. Peterson first, then we had Matt Christian, or no, then we had uh, Blonde from the Beauty and the Beta podcast. Then we had Matt Christensen, who's also from the Beauty and the Beta podcast. Uh, then we had Vernaculus, who we're getting again uh, pretty soon here. Uh, because we had some technical issues, and then we just had Gavin, then some dumb American. Uh, for next semester, I'm talking to Anthony Brian Logan, that guy T, and Dave Rubin. I'll see, I'll see um, if I can keep trying to bribe Matt. We can try this him for Halloween. If, if we get the funding for that, that would right. be fantastic. You guys might want to post on the uh, pages that it's not in person. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, it's all good, though. 